Here's what's coming up on the world today. A captured Russian soldier pleads guilty in war crimes trial in Ukraine. And a new study shows pollution is killing at least 9 million people a year. a look into Africa's falling COVID-19 vaccine rates. Welcome to the program today. I am Amarachi Ubani in Lagos. We begin with the moment a captured Russian soldier appearing in a Kyiv court in Ukraine pleaded guilty to war crimes. It's the first war crimes trial since the invasion of Ukraine on February 24. 21-year-old Vadim Shushimarin was a Russian tank commander charged with murdering a 62-year-old civilian in the northeastern Ukrainian village of Chupakiva on February 28th. He could face a life sentence if found guilty. Kiev has accused Russia of atrocities of brutality against civilians during the invasion and says it has identified more than 10,000 possible war crimes. Russia has denied targeting civilians or involvement in war crimes and accused Kiev of staging them to smear its forces. Ukrainian state prosecutors have said the soldier and four other Russian servicemen fired at and stole a private car to escape after the column was targeted by Ukrainian forces. Well, over the last 48 hours, attention in Ukraine has been turned on the situation in Mariupol, where Ukrainian fighters have surrendered to Russian soldiers at the Azovstal steel plant. And much earlier today, Mariupol's mayor, Vadim Boychenko, said via video link that there is still remains a humanitarian issue in the city, such as a lack of food, no potable water, and currently a power shortage. There's in fact no power in Mariupol as we speak. It says it's also not possible to provide any medical treatments in the city and there are no medications. It also says Russian forces had hastily buried the bodies of people killed in the assault on their, on their towns and those corpses are now in danger of polluting the water supply. Well, Russia says 959 Ukrainian fighters from the Mariupol steel works have been taken to Russian-controlled territory in Ukraine since Monday. A country's defense ministry says 694 fighters from the Ukrainian military and the Azov battalion have surrendered over the past 24 hours. Much earlier today, the Russian foreign ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova accused the Ukrainian president of spreading lies and propaganda over a statement describing the handover of fighters defending Mariupol forces as a rescue initiated by the Ukrainian side. These are some of the Ukrainian soldiers being led out of the Azovstal steel plant by Russian soldiers. Many of them wounded, but most weary from weeks of fighting, and now some respite as they're led out of Mariupol. The Russian soldiers search whatever belongings they have with them. Russia says the Ukrainian soldiers have been surrendering of their own free will. The defense ministry says 694 Ukrainian fighters, including members of the Azov regiment, had surrendered in the past 24 hours. Top-ranking Ukrainian commanders at the steelworks are still inside the plant, yet to surrender. Russia said on Tuesday that 260 65 of the Ukrainian soldiers blocked at the Azovstal plant surrendered. Among them, over 50 were seriously wounded, and all those in need of medical assistance were sent to hospital in Donetsk for treatment. The Ukrainian side confirmed that the seriously wounded soldiers have been sent to hospital. The Ukrainian fighters' surrender marked the end of weeks of siege on the last stronghold in Mariupol.
The Ukrainian side says its fighters have fulfilled their combat mission and the evacuation is only meant to save the troops in the embattled city, which is now deserted and calm, albeit destroyed. Mariupol, a key as of seaport city in eastern Ukraine, saw one of the worst bouts of violence in Russia-Ukraine conflict. The Azovstal plant, which covers an area of about 11 square kilometers, is the holdout of the Ukrainian forces in Mariupol. The Ukrainian government has jailed the defenders as heroes who changed the course of the war with Russia by keeping Russian forces at bay for 82 days of siege and bombardment. The fate, however, hangs in a balance. As separatists in Ukraine say a court will decide and that any Ukrainians found to be neo-Nazi war criminals should face an international tribunal. Meanwhile, Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko today signed a bill broadening the scope of the death penalty to include attempted acts of terrorism. Belarus, a close ally of Russia, is the only country in Europe that continues to carry out executions despite calls for a moratorium. The law is expected to come into force 10 days after its publication. Now, the European Commission has unveiled a plan for Europe to end its reliance on Russian fossil fuels by 2027 and the use uh, to pivot away from Moscow to quicken its transition to green energy. The invasion of Ukraine by Russia, Europe's tap top gas supplier, has prompted the European Union to rethink its energy policies amid sharpened concerns of supply shocks. Russia supplies 40% of the bloc's gas and 27% of its imported oil, and EU countries are struggling to agree sanctions on the latter. To wean countries off those fuels, Brussels has proposed a three-pronged plan, a switch to promote more non-Russian gas, a faster rollout of renewable energy, and more efforts at saving energy. So Repower EU will help us to save more energy, to accelerate the phasing out of fossil fuel, and most importantly, to kickstart investments on a new scale. So I would say this will be the speed charging of our European Green Deal. Energy savings are the quickest and the cheapest way to address the current energy crisis. We will therefore increase the EU energy efficiency target for 2030 from 9% to 13%. Then there is the massive investment in renewable energy, the biggest task. Here we are increasing our target for 2030 from 40% renewable energy to 45% renewable energy. We know that Ukraine is on the front line and defending our European values. We will continue to be by their side throughout this war and when they re rebuild their country. And this is the third issue I wanted to inform you about today. We are proposing for Ukraine to top up the significant short-term relief provided until now with a new exceptional macrofinancial assistance to Ukraine of up to 9 billion euros in 2022. Much earlier today, Finland and Sweden formally applied to join the NATO alliance at Allied headquarters, a decision spurred by Russia's invasion of Ukraine and setting in motion an accession process that is expected to take only a few weeks. Sweden and Finland were both neutral throughout the Cold War, and their decision to join NATO is one of the most significant changes in Europe's security architecture for decades, reflecting a sweeping shift in public opinion and the Nordic region since Russia's February 24 invasion. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, who was on hand to receive the formal applications, described the move once again as historic. And I warmly welcome the requests by Finland and Sweden to join NATO. You are our closest partners, and your membership in NATO would increase our shared security. The applications you have made today are an historic step. 
Allies will now consider the next steps on their path to NATO. The security interests of all allies have to be taken into account. And we are determined to work through all issues and reach rapid conclusions. Well, nearly all NATO members are supporting the membership bid of Sweden and Finland, save for Turkey, which says both countries should not expect it to approve the NATO bid without returning terrorists. President Tayyip Erdogan, speaking to Parliament today, said delegates from both countries should not come to Turkey to convince it to back their membership in the alliance. Ankara says we Sweden and Finland harbour people, it says, are linked to groups it deems terrorists, namely the Kurdistan Workers' Party, the PKK, Militants Group and followers of Fatula Golan, whom Ankara accuses of orchestrating a 2016 coup attempt. President Erdogan said NATO allies had never supported Turkey in its fight against Kurdish militant groups, including the Syrian Kurdish YPG, which Ankara also views as a terrorist group closely tied to the PKK. Joining me now is foreign affairs commentator Colin Swake. He joins me from Brussels. Sir Colin, it's great to see you. And let's go over, you know, why Sweden, Sweden and Finland joining NATO is not much of a problem for Russia as Ukraine. Because after all, Finland does share a border, a close one with Russia, even closer than Sweden. Uh, thank you, Maraji, uh, for having me. Well, for a start, um, I'm not quite sure that uh, Finland and Sweden joining uh, NATO isn't much of a problem for um, uh, Russia. Um, uh, Vla <clears throat> sorry, Vladimir Putin may have said so, um, but of course, um, you also have to consider uh, some of the actions that uh, he's taking that uh, actually makes you feel that he may be um, actually saying one thing. Uh, in actual fact, uh, his um, intended uh, action and his actual feeling is uh, different. So yes, uh, it bothers him. But uh, there is a sharp contrast, of course, uh, between uh, Ukraine and uh, the two other countries, uh, Finland and uh, you know uh, Sweden. Ukraine can more or less be considered as um, a sibling of, uh, of Russia. Uh, they have a lot in common. They share a common history. And uh, you know the geopolitics is uh, completely different from um, you know that of uh, Finland and uh, Sweden as a bloc, the Nordic uh, countries. Now there was um, a long-standing, I believe, a seventy-year uh, agreement uh, between uh, Finland and uh, the former um, Soviet Union uh, of non-alliance. Uh, you know, continuing to cooperate. And even Collins, we can't seem to hear you. I think you may have touched a button. Uh, but to check your audio, I think you may have touched the button. We, we stopped hearing you for a few seconds. Oh, then, really? Uh, okay. Can you hear yes. me now? I think you can yeah. continue. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So, um, in any case, the, the point I'm trying to make is that um, um, there is a sharp contrast between what Ukraine means to Russia and what uh, the Nordic uh, countries, in this specific case, uh, Finland and uh, Sweden, mean to them. Uh, Ukraine is more or less a sibling. They share a lot in common. Uh, they were part of uh, the former uh, Soviet uh, Union, uh, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, it doesn't surprise anybody that, um, you know, Russia actually feels um, uh, apprehensive and jittery over uh, Ukraine having a closer collaboration with uh, the EU and then uh, and then NATO, the reason that they are fighting uh, strongly. Of course, Crimea is an issue uh, which is um, you know part of um, you know the entire uh, conflict that now uh, you know extending. Um, now coming to Finland and Sweden, yes, uh, uh, Putin is definitely not going without a fight. Um, he may have said it's not much of a problem, but when he says so, I think. Uh, it may be in comparison with uh, with Ukraine, but we can uh, expect to see um, you know quite some um, you know resistance one way or the other, and also other forms of uh, you know diplomacy uh, playing out to ensure that uh, it doesn't happen. Yeah, and, and it does seem like, you know, Turkey is the um, is actually doing uh, Russia's bidding at this point. Uh, 
putting the stumbling block on that membership bid uh, by Sweden and Finland. Uh, Turkey is focused on security and it's calling out Finland and Sweden, Sweden especially uh, because of the PKK and uh, Fatula Golan, whom he accuses of uh, masterminding that coup, uh, which led to the killing and jailing of hundreds uh, in Turkey in 2016. And then uh, he says that there are other, you know, uh, uh, militants groups as well that seem to be, uh, that Sweden does seem to sympathize with. Um, do you think this is really a problem, you know, for Turkey, or this is also Turkey uh, playing to the gallery for uh, Russia? I think it's a combination of, um, of reasons, uh, but I think uh, overall, um, what is playing out here is uh, transnationalism. Um, Erdogan uh, has proven himself to be a very, very astute um, uh, politician, uh, one that would uh, seize on every opportunity to uh, negotiate the best deal for uh, Turkey. Now, let us uh, recall that uh, pretty recently, uh, he actually held uh, the European Union to ransom when uh, you know, he threatened to uh, open the floodgates of uh, refugees uh, so that uh, you know, they would storm uh, uh, Europe, except they uh, actually uh, concede to some uh, you know, financial incentive for Turkey. He had his way. He was paid uh, you know, huge uh, sums of money, uh, uh, you know, and then he was able to um, you know, keep the refugees uh, from uh, flooding uh, Europe. So I believe that he is using this opportunity of uh, Finland and Sweden um, ascension into NATO to uh, actually get something that he hasn't quite, um, you know, managed to make any headway in the past, which is uh, supporting Turkey in their fight against PKK and uh, other, you know, Kurdish uh, minority uh, groups. Um, well, uh, that is his negotiating, um, you know, tool. And um, it does look like the uh, European Union, uh, specifically Finland and Sweden, are positively disposed to actually listening to him because, uh, I mean, they've taken it uh, lightheartedly in terms of saying, well, it's not a problem. We are going to uh, you know, uh, negotiate with uh, Turkey. And so uh, they are very confident. And I believe that the source of that, their confidence, is that um, one way or the other, they are going to manage to accede to his uh, request. Now, another angle to it, of course, is that in his address to Parliament today, um, Erdogan has said that they should not bother to come, but I believe that is uh, talking tough. Uh, ultimately, I'm sure they will be able to uh, smoothen this out. As far as the link or the role that uh, Putin is playing in all of this, I mean, behind the scene, encourage working with um, uh, Erdogan, well, it wouldn't surprise anyone that uh, Vladimir Putin is doing that. However, if you assess the core of uh, Erdogan's objection, it has absolutely nothing to do with any strategic uh, reason other than the terrorist uh, issue that uh, you know, he has uh, brought up. So uh, once that is uh, sorted out to his satisfaction, I believe that the rest um, you know, will uh, flow smoothly. Uh, Colin, I just want to quickly get your thoughts on this. Mariupol, as it stands now, has fallen. The Ukrainian fighters have surrendered to the Russian uh, forces. The city uh, provides a link to Crimea. Has Ukraine now officially been divided by Russia? Well, you can say so. Uh, it wouldn't be wrong to uh, consider um, Ukraine, uh, as things stand, uh, being divided by Russia with the fall. Uh, well, we need to be a bit uh, careful here because uh, it does look like the last song hasn't been uh, sung, but uh, indeed it's looking like, um, you know, Maripol has, uh, has fallen. Um, so, yes, that effectively means a major, major victory for uh, Russia in their bid to uh, actually, um, you know, control um, Ukraine, but first you know, chopping it up, um, you know, in different bits and pieces, and then uh, rearranging the cards according to their own, um, you know, interest. So, yes, um, this is a major win for Russia in that regard. Well, so much more to also talk about uh, as the developments uh, continue uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Collins, thank you again for speaking with me. Always my pleasure. Thank you for having me on, Rachel. Coming up on the program...
Well, this after the break, of course, a half a million people fleeing the Indian state of Assam due to heavy floods. Stay with us. Welcome back. Weather well, events have been anything but calm since Uruguay was hit by strong winds and highways as subtropical cyclone Yaken. Yakikan, beg your pardon, swept through the South American nation. A one man was killed when a tree fell on his house amid gusts of 98 kilometer uh, winds in the capital, Montevideo. Seaside roads were covered in foam, whipped by, by the waves uh, after battering Uruguay. Cyclone Yakikan moved north to Brazil, where it caused widespread power cuts. Roofs were blown off and trees uprooted on the coasts and also further inland. Uh, the cyclone, the name of the cyclone, meaning heaven's sound in the Gurani language, triggered an orange alert, the second highest in Uruguay today. Meanwhile, the World Meteorological Organization says the world's oceans in 2021 grew to their warmest and most acidic levels on record, while melting ice sheets helped push sea levels to new heights. A report by the organization shows oceans saw the most striking extremes, detailing a range of turmoil wrought by climate change. The levels of uh, climate warming, carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere in 2021 surpassed previous records, according to the WMO. Globally, the average temperature last year was 1.11 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial average as the world inches closer to the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold beyond which the effects of warming are expected to become drastic. Last year's temperatures were tempered slightly compared to 2020 because of the cooling effects of La Nina in the Pacific through the year, was still among the top seven hottest years on record. Today's State of the Climate report is a dismal litany of humanity's failure to tackle climate disruption. Sea level rise, ocean heat, greenhouse gas concentrations and ocean acidification set alarming new records in 2021. Global mean sea level increased at more than double the previous rate and is mainly due to accelerating loss of ice mass. Ocean warming also shows a particularly strong increase in the past two decades and is penetrating to ever deeper levels. Much of the ocean experienced at least one strong marine heat wave at some point in 2021. Welcome. But we have broken uh, record in, in, in ocean heat, uh, which is more conservative uh, 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 than, than the atmospheric temperatures, which are varying according to these uh, ocean temperatures. Uh, so we have uh, now record amount of heat uh, stored in the oceans, and 90% uh, uh, of the excess heat that we have produced to the planet, uh, they are stored in ocean. More weather events now in India. More than 500 people have fled their homes in the northeastern state of Assam to escape heavy floods triggered by pre-monsoon rains that drowned seven people as they warned that the situation there could get worse. Locals in the districts of Hojai were seen evacuating with their belongings as many residents said floodwaters rising up to their chests inundated their homes and their crops. One of the world's largest rivers, the Brahmaputra, which flows into India and neighboring Bangladesh from Tibet, burst its banks in Assam over the last three days, inundating more than 1,500 villages. Torrential rains lashed most of the rugged state, and the downpour continued today with more forecast over the next two days. Water levels in Brahmaputra were expected to rise even further. Pakistan is dealing with a dust storm sweeping across the capital city, Islamabad, bringing rain and some brief respite to its residents as a South Asian nation reeled under a record-breaking heat wave. The weather agency says strong winds triggered by the storm shrouded buildings and shook trees in the city. Meteorologists say a drop in temperatures by 3 to 4 degrees Celsius in the country has... Uh, which has been gripped by intense heat in the past months. And those temperatures are forecast to return to 39 to 41 degrees Celsius today. 
uh, Pakistan faced the hottest March in 61 years as an intense heat wave touched highs of 47 degrees Celsius in parts of the country. Neighboring India is also grappling with the unprecedented heat. The country's vast majority of poor workers who generally work outdoors are vulnerable to the scorching temperatures. Officials believe that more than a billion people are at risk of heat-related impacts in the region. Science is a warning, uh, the li linking the onset of uh, intense summer to climate change. Uh, for the first time in decades, Pakistan has gone from winter to summer without the spring season. Our team of scientists say worsening outdoor air pollution and toxic lead poisoning have kept global deaths from environmental contamination at an estimated 9 million per year since 2015, countering modest progress made in tackling pollution elsewhere. Air pollution from industry processes, along with urbanization, have driven 7% increase in pollution-related deaths from 2015 to 2019. An earlier version of a work published in 2017 estimates the death toll from pollution at roughly 9 million per year, or about one in every six deaths worldwide and the cost of the global economy is up to 4.6 trillion dollars per year and that puts pollution on par with smoking in terms of global deaths covid 19 by comparison has killed about 6.7 million people globally since the pandemic began uh, for the most of the recent study we're looking at published in the online journal lancet planetary health authors analyzed 2019 data from the global burden of disease an ongoing study by the University of Washington, which addresses overall pollution exposure and calculates mortality risk. So the, the key findings of this report are kind of shocking, which are not much has changed in five years in terms of the overall number of premature deaths. We're still seeing 9 million deaths a year from all types of pollution, air, water, and soil. The big difference in this update compared to the 2017 one is that we're seeing a increase in number of deaths from modern pollution. And so what I mean by modern pollution is that which is caused by industrialization, urbanization, right? These are the, the concerns that we're really seeing rise now and that number is just skyrocketing. It's actually increased 66%. So the number of premature deaths from modern pollution has increased 66% since 2000. Conversely, we're seeing a reduction in number of deaths from traditional pollution, right? This is a poverty related pollution. It's that caused by indoor cook stoves or water and sanitation. And because of the amount of investment that's gone into those areas, we're really seeing those numbers come down. And so the overall net effect is actually that there's the same number of deaths. So the improvements that we're seeing in traditional pollution are actually being offset by this increase in deaths from modern pollution. Bringing it home now, the European Union Agents for Citizens Driven Transformation Program for the British Council has been holding a program this week on the Cross-State Regional Reflection for Act program with the civil society organizations in Nigeria to help translate capacity building to institutional building as essential to the sustainability of non-governmental organizations in the country. It's a mouthful. Well, joining me now is component manager for the ACT program, Hafsat Mustafa, as she's here with me in the studio. Hafsat, welcome to the world today. Thank you, Amarachi. And I know that for many Nigerians, this is probably the first time they're hearing about ACTS. So what's it about? Uh, the um, Agent for Citizens During Transformation Program is a um, civil society capacity um, strengthening program it's funded by the European Union, but implemented by the British Council. And it's a three-year program. It ends in 2023. Um, so basically, we're working with uh, about 200 CSOs across Nigeria in 10 states to support. Um, so we're not um, doing anything new per se, but we're adding to the capacity strengthening that has over time been received by civil society organizations, both on... Um, the areas of internal governance, um, their processes, operational processes, financial procedures, and strengthening the engagement, particularly with the media, with the legislature, and with the executive, um, supporting them to uh, open 
government dialogue and, and the like. So that's basically what we're doing. So uh, we're in Lagos for uh, about a week. We're doing uh, cross-state regional reflection meetings, uh, which is an end-of-year meeting for us where sharing of ideas happen. Have, in, have, has said. I, I, I understand that um, we, we, since we're having problems hearing you, our viewers are calling in. Um, so let's just take a, a, a quick break. I would take some other stories and then come back to you. Is that okay? Because okay, uh, I really want people to hear you know, what you're saying. So in the meantime, the new analysis, uh, uh, well, looking at uh, the British economy, uh, separated judicial contaminants uh, such as indoor um, smoke. I do believe this is the wrong uh, report, I, pardon me. Um, in the meantime, uh, as COVID-19 does finally rush into Africa, demanding is the demand for uh, COVID vaccines is dropping. Health officials are worried that the unvaccinated populations increase the risk of new variants springing up on the continent. To boost uptake, countries are focusing on mobile vaccination campaigns in which teams visit communities, educate them about vaccines, and then offer doses on site. The Gambia, in the middle of a week-long nationwide campaign to get its citizens vaccinated against COVID-19. The team manages to convince truck driver Adama Sese. I wanted to do it. I had even heard that they were at the police office, but as I am a driver until now, I did not have the opportunity to go and get vaccinated against COVID-19. I do it to protect myself, but also to go to other countries like Senegal. Unfortunately, Sese is the only one of 10 people the team, led by Joseph Mendy, manages to get vaccinated that day. It's still complicated, though, because you have to sensitize people. You talk to them before you start the actual process. You have to convince them that the vaccine is safe, it's good, it's beneficial before they take it. And where we are going, actually, is a university. So most of them are already getting the information. Once set up at the university campus, Mendy only encounters refusal after refusal. Students either ignore him or say they are too afraid of needles. We are just from the whole we, we talk with them, ask them to follow us, but since we are here, none of them came out. So you see, it's really, really frustrating. It's really frustrating. This is the situation we find ourselves in, so it's difficult. So we try another area, we try our chance, and we we'll talk to them and see again whether it will work. Misinformation is also tough to dislodge on a continent where sickness is often seen as resulting from supernatural forces and where big pharmaceutical companies have in the past run dubious clinical trials resulting in deaths. The, the vaccine on your body it might have a side effects. So that's why for me, and I have believed that many people have been saying that if they inject the vaccine, you, you might have a side effects on your body and you might be end, ending losing your life, so that's why. This country's experience is not unique on the continent. Only 17% of Africa's 1.3 billion population is fully vaccinated against COVID-19, versus above 70% in some countries. In part, because richer nations hoarded supplies last year when global demand was greatest, to the chagrin of African nations desperate for international supplies. In Zambia, where coverage is 11%, officials are planning outreach campaigns, but worry they won't be able to cover the cost of feeding doctors working far from home or pay for their transportation. Now the continent has too many COVID-19 vaccine doses. We realized that in the heat of the COVID, when the COVID came, when I mean during the access, when the incidence was high, when the cases were surging up, people were eager to take the vaccines yes, in order to protect themselves. But now a lot of people have been covered and the incidence is coming down, the case, the daily cases are coming down. So they are hesitant. A lot of people are hesitant to take. So the strategy was to move to the community, move from door to door, 
to convince them, to talk to them, to tell them how important the vaccine is and the role the vaccine plays in curbing the disease and others. To boost uptake, countries including Ghana, Gambia, Sierra Leone and Kenya are focusing on mobile vaccination campaigns that visit communities, but finances are stretched. Ghana, one of Africa's most developed economies and one applauded for its early inoculation surge, has a funding gap of $30 million to carry out another campaign, according to the World Bank. Irregular power supply jeopardizes vaccine cold chain and doses expire. And Spain's Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez has welcomed Qatar's Emir Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani's decision to invest $5 billion in Spanish projects to boost national economy. Emir Al Thani told an audience at a dinner held in King Felipe's palace in Madrid yesterday that the amount underscored Qatar's confidence in the Spanish economy's strength. Qatar signed bilateral agreements with Spain to invest in projects funded by the European Union COVID recovery funds. The first such agreements between a member state and a non-EU country. The investments, mainly in technology and environmental projects, are due to be implemented within two to three years. Spain, the main recipient of the EU funds, a total of 140 billion euros, is scrambling to get support from private and foreign investors to speed up its recovery from the record 11% contraction it suffered in 2020 as a result of the pandemic. We're in Armenia now where protesters briefly shut down the metro network in the capital today. Part of a growing anti-government unrest in recent weeks against possible concessions, concessions over territory disputed with neighbor Azerbaijan. We're looking at footage from social media showing protesters standing in the doors of metro carriages, blocking trains moving. The activists were demanding the resignation of Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan and chanting anti-government slogans. A statement published an hour later, uh, the metro said the traffic had been restored and over 350 people were detained across the city. According uh, to news media, citing the police. A police spokesman, however, did not immediately respond to a request for comment on how many people have been arrested and why. <laughs> A man is pleaded guilty to stabbing five people to death and attempting to murder 11 others with a bow and arrow, attacks which spread fear across a small town in Norway in October last year. A rampage through Kosberg lasted more than half an hour as the attacker randomly targeted people in their homes, on the streets and in a store, while narrowly missing others. Prosecutors say the accused, Espen Anderson Brathen, a Dane who has lived in Norway his, the whole of his life, suffered from mental illness at the time of the attacks and should be sentenced to psychiatric care rather than prison. Four women and one man, aged between 52 and 78, were stabbed to death in the October 13 attacks, while three were wounded by Brathen's arrows. In addition to the murder and murder attempts, his stands accused of making aggravated threats against 13 people and one account of attempted bodily harm. But still ahead on the world today. The Buffalo shooting in the United States has residents weighed down by grief. They might receive some comfort from these very friends. Welcome back, and we still have her in the studio, component manager for the ACTS program. It's an initiative uh, for the British Council. It's been holding this week uh, the, uh, the cross-state regional reflection of ACTS program with the civil society organizations in Nigeria to help translate capacity building to institutional building. And Hafsat uh, Mustafa has been here. Uh, you were talking about uh, the uh, ACTS not being the same with civil societies, and you were explaining, you know, how it is you're providing capacity building for those civil society organizations? Yeah, okay. Um, ACT is um, 
um, civil society capacity strengthening program, just like um, every other donor supported um, civil society capacity program. But uh, what we're doing differently is we are providing um, um, tailored support for civil society organizations. And uh, another thing we're doing differently is we're looking holistically at the organizational development structure of our, our, uh, every CSO that we work with. So this means we're supporting them to build internal systems, financial pro strong financial processes, their governance structure. We're looking at um, reviewing uh, board of trustee management, and then we're looking at the relationship with media, with the legislature, with the executive and the likes. So that helps civil society to um, work more efficiently with diverse stakeholders. So um, that's how we're working differently. And then we're also introducing, um, uh, we're matching organizations that we support with coaches and mentors who um, provide direct engagement in the offices of this civil society organization. So it's a three-month um, tailored coaching support to help them build organizational strategies, a multi-year strategy which helps them continue to sustain the way they, they um, provide support to communities. And are there specific civil society organizations you're, you're looking for, people who have, you know, major areas where they focus on specialties, for example, uh, the girl child or education or stuff like that? Is there a particular area you're looking at? Yeah, so that's another unique thing that we're doing because um, um, unlike um, other projects that are uh, theme, uh, one thematic area focused, we're actually diverse in, in that aspect because we're looking at um, several thematic areas that are related to the um, European Union areas of support. Remember I said ACT is funded by the EU and implemented by the British Council. So we have organizations, 200 working across Nigeria, uh, working on health, on education, on water, on climate change, um, technical and vocational education, gender and social inclusion, water and sanitation, almost all areas of social development. And so this helps because we also have a funding mechanism to support at least 100 out of the 200 um, CSOs that we're working with. It helps them to um, provide additional support to development agenda in their states. Yeah, and how do you keep the civil society organizations accountable? There's so many of them in Nigeria, and if you're yeah. looking, you know, you know you have the ones that you're looking over, how do you keep them accountable if you're giving them grants? Yeah, so we have um, our internal um, accountability systems, but um, remember, it's a capacity building program. So one of the first things we did was actually to get um, civil society organizations to understand how um, to manage um, finances and to keep records and also to um, increase their legitimacy. That's um, providing accountability to the people that they support and um, also providing accountability to government, to the public generally. Mm -hmm. And also, we have a component that is focused on ensuring that civil society adhere to regulatory provisions. So, and that includes um, submitting annual returns to CAC at the right time. That's the Corporate Affairs Commission. So those are ways which um, civil society organizations are, uh, are made to become more transparent. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, citizen, citizens engagement. Citizens are already engaged. Uh, and I also see that you also uh, have gender and social inclusion on your list. Um, I want to talk more about that, how you interpret that in such a way that it's not glossed over by society and it's not some of the same that we have been hearing. Yeah, okay, citizens engagement for, yeah, citizens engagement is continuum. Uh, yeah, citizens are already engaged, but more people are coming up, so society is ever growing and there are new ways of work and those are some of the things we're introducing to, um, um, to our civil society partners. So um, what we do is facilitate um, their capacity to engage more efficiently, either with their beneficiaries or with government. So we um, ensure that we support the process of participatory planning, mm -hmm. especially when um, projects would be implemented. We expect civil society organizations to not just assume that they know answers to the problems of any community where they work. We expect that they sit with stakeholders in the community, get their buy-in, ensure that there's ownership of that process such that when they leave, there's sustainability. And then on, um, for gender and social inclusion, 
So um, what we're trying to do is to ensure that um, people don't just gloss over the term gender when we um, speak. We're trying to create avenues to ensure that the voice of marginalized people um, are brought to the fore, and that can only be done by the civil society organizations themselves. So what we do is to build their capacity on how to mainstream gender in their planning, in their implementation, throughout the um, project cycle management, we ensure, even in the, the tools they use for monitoring and evaluation, we ensure that there are gender components, uh, social inclusion components that they are looking at, because there are many issues. Yes, people have been right. doing it, but there are lots of social inclusion issues, um, even in infrastructure, so many things that persons with disability are still not able to access yeah. in the country. So yeah. the advocacy will continue, uh, definitely. Have, that's great work you're doing, and I, I do really want to support you from here. As we'll be monitoring, you know, your progress uh, with the civil society organizations. Wishing you all the best. Thanks Thank you again. so much, Amaret. Thank, Thank you for you stopping for having by. Me. You're welcome. While the future of Title 42 is sweeping pandemic-related expulsion policies that has affected closely down the U.S. asylum system, uh, it remains in limbo in the courts. Uh, border patrol agents in southern Arizona continue to see a high number of border crossings. Uh, numbers have increased during the current fiscal year, which began in October 2021. Now, to date, the number of apprehensions or encounters is more than 130,000. This is the Arizona border border town of Sasabe. A pilot called ground agents for backup to apprehend a group of 30 people that are dispersed running into different directions in the bushes. Some Republican politicians have expressed concern that these scenarios will only be more common if Title 42, which has allowed U.S. authorities to quickly expel migrants to Mexico, is repealed. While well, that is being decided, border officials are clear. If Title 42 goes away, the border is not going to open, according to them. Our numbers of apprehensions or encounters is more than 130,000 fiscal years to date. So our fiscal year starts in October and then all the way to today. So that's up more than 50% compared to last year. So most of the people that we apprehend at Tucson sector, it's people that do not want to be apprehended, people that wear camouflage from head to toe, they're single adults. I think it's uh, upwards of 85% of the people that we encounter. So we are not seeing the same thing as other sectors where they have large family groups and unaccompanied juveniles or children that come and just turn themselves in into border patrol. If Title 42 goes away, um, the border is not going to be open. So we are going to be processing everybody humanely, but we are going to enforce our immigration laws. So if someone does not have legal status or a legal way to stay in the United States, they're going to be returned and processed under our immigration laws. So the border is not open now when we have Title 42, and the border will not be open once Title 42 goes away. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison, well, he, he's not playing football with these kids. He was actually there campaigning. Uh, the Australian general elections are just a few days away, on May 21st, in fact. So while campaigning in the state of Tasmania today, ahead of the federal elections, uh, he participated in a friendly soccer game and accidentally tackled a child to the ground. But he wasn't hurt. With his eyes on the ball, Morrison stepped to his left and collided with Luca Fauvet from the Devonport strikers, landing him, landing on top of him. And Morrison quickly rolled over, as we saw there, and checked on Fauvet, who was unharmed before the pair exchanged high fives. <laughs> Well, he did say he could be a bit of a bulldozer. As we had the program, there were volunteer team of professional crisis counselors travel with their comfort dogs to Buffalo, New York, to help locals deal with the trauma of the recent shooting at a grocery store. If we remember, 18-year-old Peyton Gendron, a white teenager, accused of firing 
opening fire with a semi-automatic rifle in the predominantly African-American neighborhood uh, of Buffalo. I did that on we are Saturday. Tri -state canine response say team he carried out the act of racially motivated violent extremism at the Tops Buffalo, Friendly Market when he shot 13 Florida, people. Jersey, now these volunteers are trying to help locals Delaware. get a hold of what has happened and provide some comfort as they grieve the their loved ones. After the mass shooting. We support we are Tri-State Canine Response Team. We're an all-volunteer group, and the group that deployed to um, Buffalo are from Florida, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware. and Delaware. We <clears throat> got an invite to come to help the community after the mass shooting. We support first responders and the community, family members, and victims. Well, the dogs work with us as we're crisis counselors. They help us work with the individuals after something happens to kind of start to rebuild the resiliency in the community. There are, we call them our co-therapists sometimes. So they'll be able to make the person feel comfortable to de-stress during the situation and to start talking about things for psychological first aid that will start to help them to um, receive services in the community. Very thoughtful of the volunteer workers and our thoughts and prayers with the people of Buffalo. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani. I'll see you again later.